Good morning, and welcome to worship on this fifth Sunday in Lent. My name is Pastor Seth Novak, and on behalf of the entire community of Agnes Day, I'd like to thank you for being a part of this worship service today. Our building may be closed, but the church is still open. You can download a worship bulletin with the order of service from the link in the video description below. The International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination is observed annually on this day, March 21st, the anniversary of the Sharpeville Massacre in 1960, when police in Sharpeville, South Africa, opened fire and killed 69 people at a peaceful demonstration against apartheid pass laws. Additionally, just this month, the Asian and Pacific Islander Association of our Evangelical Lutheran Church in America issued a statement addressing the increase in violence directed toward Asian American and Pacific Islander communities, a statement which was then affirmed by our ELCA Conference of Bishops. That statement calls on our church to declare today, the fifth Sunday in Lent, to be a lament in order to express our solidarity with, our help in healing, and our support of Asian American victims of violence. This is especially pertinent uh, after the events of this week, the shooting in Atlanta, Georgia. Recognizing that eliminating racial discrimination is a calling to be lived out every day, we join this day with our siblings of color in lament and hope as, we, as encouragement to continue that journey with renewed determination. Before we begin our worship today, I'd like to take just a few moments to allow us to share our prayer concerns from this community. I'll invite you to share any uh, requests uh, or any prayer requests or prayers of gratitude that you may have in the chat or the comments, being mindful of privacy in this public space. Uh, today, we especially remember, uh, we keep in prayer uh, our gratitude for Leif and Katie D, who welcomed new baby boy Tage into the world on Tuesday. He was born at seven pounds, eight ounces, and is 19 inches long. Everybody is doing great, and Eric uh, thinks his new little brother is a cute baby. That's what he says, cute baby. So we're very happy to celebrate with Leif and Katie and Eric this week. Uh, at this time, I'll invite you to turn to your bulletin as we begin our worship. Instead of our normal confession today, we'll be using this litany of remembrance uh, in, in observance of the International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. Dear people of God, our history is marred by oppression, by the enslavement of those who differ from us, by the forces of racism that attack human dignity. The sin of racism is woven into our lives and our cultures, in small and in great ways, in things done and left undone. We especially recognize today that since the pandemic started in early 2020, there have been more than 3,000 reported incidents of racism against people of Asian descent alone. Just this January, an 84-year-old Thai man was shoved to the ground while he was taking his morning walk in San Francisco. And in the neighboring city of Oakland, a 91-year-old man was pushed down, causing him to fall on his face to the pavement. And then, of course, we have the events of this week in Atlanta, where uh, several Asian women were gunned down by a white gunman. For a community whose elders are deeply respected and looked up to as a source of communal and filial unity and wisdom, this hits hard. As followers of Christ, we reject racism and oppression of other human beings. In building Christ's beloved community, we must strive to love all people, respect all people, and work for the good of all people. We must stand alongside God's children of every race and language and culture and work together as agents of justice, peace, and reconciliation. And so in the assurance of our forgiveness, I invite you into a communal confession to show our solidarity with our siblings being harmed by racism. God the Father, you freed your people from slavery in Egypt, yet the legacy of slavery deforms our lives today. Have mercy on us. God the Son, you prayed that all would be united in your love and service, yet the divisions among us rend your body. 
have mercy on us. God, the Holy Spirit, you inspire us to live peaceably with all, yet the stain of genocide and internment mars our striving for justice. Have mercy on us. Lord, your people have harmed one another and the earth through negligence, greed, and self-interest. Have mercy on us. Your people have failed to condemn discrimination that leads to unrest. Have mercy on us. Your people have decried violence while overlooking inequity and frustration from which arises. Have mercy on us. Your people have practiced injustice for economic gain and have oppressed others to make a false peace. Have mercy on us. Your people have sought comfort and advantage for ourselves at the cost of injustice for others. Have mercy on us. Your people have welcomed solace over conflict and ignored the cries of those harmed by our comfort. Have mercy on us. Your people have grasped for this world's goods and been arrogant toward those who have little. Have mercy on us. Your people have not shared the good things we, we have been given and blamed the poor for their poverty. Have mercy on us. Lord, your people have been fearful and distrustful of those who are different from us. Have mercy on us. Your people have been indifferent to the pain and suffering of our sisters and brothers. Have mercy on us. Your people have held in contempt those who need our help and not loved them with our whole hearts. Have mercy on us. Your people have been self-satisfied in our privilege and denied our oppression of others. Have mercy on us. Your people have preferred order over justice and isolation over struggle for peace. Have mercy on us. Your people have, been quiet, have quietly held good intentions and kept silent the message of reconciliation. Have mercy on us. Your people have failed to act with courage for the sake of love. Have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us. Grant us courage and conviction and strengthen us to love others who are unlike us. May God, the holy and undivided Trinity, make us compassionate in our actions and courageous in our works, that we may see Christ's beloved community in our own day. Amen. At a recent protest against anti-Asian racism, black and Asian ministers shared stories of embodied hurt in a form of an embodied movement as nonverbal gestures of healing and blessing. In our solidarity with our Asian, American, and Pacific Islander siblings in Christ, I invite you to join me in this embodied blessing and healing. I'll do it once explaining what each part means, and then we'll do it silently together. So we start with a deep breath. And we place our hands on our heart. I see myself. I acknowledge my own feelings, my own body. And then bow. We acknowledge sacredness, resilience, humanity, strength in myself. Look around. I see you. Cup your hands to your ears. I hear you. Fold our arms across our chest, symbolizing mourning, the collective feeling of sadness, grief, and lament and anger. We bow again, acknowledging sacredness, resilience, humanity, and strength in others. Open our hands with palms up and take a breath. These are the blessings received from God and one another. And then we touch one hand to our heart and extend the other out to another person. This is heart to heart compassion. So let us now begin this embodied blessing and healing together in silence. We begin by taking a deep breath.
Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. O God, with steadfast love you draw us to yourself, and in mercy you receive our prayers. Strengthen us to bring forth the fruits of the Spirit, that through life and death we may live in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading is from Jeremiah, beginning at the 31st chapter. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant which they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive them their iniquity and remember their sin no more. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Oh, 
The second reading is from Hebrews chapter 5. So also Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Then in the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all those who obey him having been designated by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Word of God, word of life, thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 12th chapter. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who, in spite of his Greek name, was from Bethsaida in Galilee. And they said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. So Philip went and told Andrew, and then Philip and Andrew went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it. But those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor now my soul is troubled. And what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, This voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death that he was going to die the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Desmond Tutu is on my mind this week. For Lent this year, Father Eric Stell of St. John's Episcopal and I have been presenting every Wednesday on the Saints for Today. Each week we take a look at a different Christian from history and see how they balanced reaching out in solidarity to people who were unlike them, to uh, with maintaining their principles and their focus on the gospel. This past week, I was privileged to share the story of Desmond Tutu. 
Tutu, of course, was one of the leaders involved in dismantling apartheid in South Africa in the last half of the 20th century. I've been amazed and humbled over this last couple weeks as I've been reading about him to learn not only of his work, but how deeply and genuinely he cared for all people, not just the black South Africans who were suffering under and resisting apartheid, but also the white South Africans who feared and hated and rejected him. I talked about him and told stories for half an hour on Wednesday, and I'm not gonna do that again here, but I do wanna share one story to kind of give you a sense of this man and who he is. So Tutu was elected Bishop of Johannesburg in 1985. Actually, he wasn't elected, he was appointed. The General Assembly, whose job it was to elect the uh, bishop, couldn't make a decision. There was too much debate over his election, and so the election had to be referred to the Synod of Bishops who appointed him. Um, anyway, after his appointment, one particular white priest who was a critic of his and was very adamantly opposed to his nomination for bishop found himself in the hospital for two weeks. That man was surprised to find that on every single day of those two weeks, his new bishop called him out of genuine care for his well-being to offer him support and pastoral care. That's the kind of man that Bishop Tutu is. But as amazing in that man and his life are, I find myself this week equally amazed by the very idea of apartheid. It seems so alien to me to have such deep-seated and ingrained disdain for another human being, especially based on something so arbitrary as skin color or ethnicity. And yet, such prejudicial racism is real. So real, in fact, that there has been a day set aside every year, this day, March 21st, to acknowledge the toll that racism has taken on our world and to recommit ourselves to ending it. Although apartheid was an official government policy in South Africa, we in this country are, of course, no strangers to the idea. In America, we are still dealing with the aftermath of slavery and the lasting effects it continues to have on our national consciousness. As a nation, we have internalized those ideas and those experiences as a part of our social psyche. So much that uh, they affect how we treat not just people of African descent or the native inhabitants of this continent, but all people of color. Whether we agree with those ideas or are actively working against them, you have to admit, they still shape, they are still an integral part of who we are today. They still shape who we are and what we're doing. I was appalled this week to come across a quote from Hendrik Vervoort, the one-time Minister of Native Affairs in South Africa, who said, There is no place for the Bantu, which was a native tribe, there is no place for the Bantu in the European community above the level of certain forms of labor. What is the use of teaching a Bantu child mathematics when it cannot use it in practice? But I was equally appalled to read that Bishop Tutu himself had internalized these negative ideas about his own people. He recalls how once when traveling on a Nigerian plane, he had this feeling, this nagging worry on discovering that both the pilot and the co-pilot were black, the result of having been conditioned his whole life to think that only whites could be entrusted with such positions of responsibility. How terrible is that? To have these own ideas about your very own kinsmen. Racism has been ingrained in American culture almost from its very beginning. It's been called America's original sin. I wonder if today, I wonder today if we might also call it America's old covenant. We often talk about a covenant as a promise or an agreement or a contract. But there's such a thing as a social covenant, too. The agreement or the pattern upon which our society is built. It might just as easily be described as a pattern or a paradigm. A framework that establishes how things are, how we operate. 
Racism is at the heart of our national paradigm, our national covenant. Our problem, a problem shared by much of the world at this point, exported and spread by European colonialism in which America played a seminal part, is that although we ended the practice of slavery, we never changed the paradigm. After either escaping or being emancipated from slavery, the first hurdle that black Americans faced was the fact that they had nothing. No money, no property, no means to make a living, uh, no family, no social connections to help them out. Everything was owned by white Americans. Folks, folks who managed to escape sometimes found a means of supporting themselves, sometimes uh, through the charity or uh, compassion of um, generous white folks. But after the end of the Civil War, the country had this glut of newly free, newly impoverished people with no means of supporting themselves. The solution, if you can call it that, that was found was sharecropping. Many of those people went back to work for the very same people who had enslaved them. And they received as compensation only a share of the crops which they produced. Slavery had been officially outlawed, but in essence, it was still practiced. It was still the reality. And thus, the Old Covenant continued. If we are ever really to escape the shadow of slavery and racism, we will need a new paradigm. After apartheid ended, the nation of South Africa was faced with a massive problem. The white citizens who had formerly held all the power were still living in South Africa. The new democratically elected government of South Africa had a choice to make. They could have done to those whites what the whites had done to them. They could have retaliated, simply turned apartheid back against the people who had invented it. Or they could have tried what America tried. They could have instituted some nominal laws and policies designed to protect freedoms and sort of um, shift the balance a little bit and pretend everything was fine. But there was too much animosity, too much anger and frustration. There would have just been more violence. These non-solutions were part of the same old European paradigm. So instead, the new president, Nelson Mandela, and the new Archbishop of Cape Town, Desmond Tutu, began establishing a new paradigm. They formed the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. This new paradigm, this new covenant, didn't operate under the same retributive individualistic rules that the old apartheid government had. Those rules and patterns are what had caused the problem. They couldn't solve it. So instead of relying on Western ideas about justice and crime and punishment, the South Africans turned to distinctly African ideas. In many African cultures, justice is restorative rather than retributive. Simply put, this means that when someone commits a crime, the focus isn't on punishing the guilty or on catharsis for the victims. It's on the health and the healing and the well-being of the whole community. The guilty are still held accountable, but there's an awareness that they are still a part of this community. And an effort is made to bring them back into it. A communal solution must involve healing for the perpetrator as well as for the wronged party, and indeed for everybody else in the community. And so the Truth and Reconciliation Commission heard the testimonies of people who experienced the horrors of apartheid firsthand. Violence, imprisonment, persecution, humiliation. But it also heard the stories of those who had committed the horrors. Both persecutors and persecuted had the chance to hear from one another, to come face to face with the pain that had been inflicted and the people who had inflicted it. And then they had to work together to decide how to move forward to bring healing. It was a long, arduous, emotional process. It's still going on even today. It's far from perfect. A lot of people report that they felt it was ineffective but most people who, in, 
who were involved with it agree that it did bring about healing, that it began repairing that damage that had been done by uh, decades of apartheid. This is perhaps more than we can say about what's been done in our own country to attempt to bring, out, bring about healing after chattel slavery and segregation and uh, anti-immigration laws and the Chinese Exclusion Act and so many other things. Now a century and a half after the end of slavery, many think that it's too late to do anything. Many more wonder why we can't just move on. But how can we move on when we are still living under the same old covenant, the same paradigm that created the problem? The thought of trying something new, especially after so much time has passed, is frightening. Those of us with privilege are afraid of losing that privilege, of being forced to give up what we consider to be ours, what has been ours for so long. People worry about opening old wounds, about the difficulty of figuring out what is fair and just, about being taken advantage of or being perceived as taking advantage. The same old antebellum fears wear new faces and convince us that our safety or our social order is in peril. Perhaps for these reasons, conversations about reparations or criminal justice reform have yet to gain much traction. If we are to move ahead in the work of dismantling racism, we are going to have to find a new way of being to make a new covenant with one another. Of course, it's frightening to consider starting over from scratch, to be faced with that possibility of failure. I can only imagine that such similar fears gripped the hearts of those who first heard I, uh, Jeremiah's words about God's new covenant. When a people's entire identity is founded on that old covenant, any mention of a new covenant no matter how rosy the promise, is still terrifying. It's for this reason that Jesus says, those who love their life lose it. He's not issuing a new commandment. He's not making a threat. He's just stating fact. As long as we remain focused on ourselves and our own well-being and the well-being of those in our tribe, the people who look or think or act or believe like us, we will just keep circling the drain, drawing ever closer to the big drop. In order to break out of that cycle of hurt and fear and loss, Jesus says, we need to paradoxically stop focusing on survival. Stop focusing on our own well-being and learn to hate our lives. I wonder if we wouldn't do well to take a page from South Africa's book, to focus instead on the health of our whole community, our whole nation, rather than just trying to protect the rights of individual groups. Maybe we could even use our own Truth and Justice, excuse me, Truth and Re Reconciliation Commission. That kind of a letting go is tantamount to death. It's tantamount to throwing our lives away, to throwing away everything we hold dear and know to be effective. But Jesus reminds us that thanks to God's promise and God's presence, death is always a gateway to new life. A new covenant can be a hard promise to which to cling. But along with that promise is the assurance that we never walk the road alone. Jesus doesn't just tell us about new life, he shows it to us. By letting go of his own life, laying it down for those he calls friends. Friends, by the way, who are the very people who betrayed and rejected and killed him. He experiences new life. Life which he then shares with us. Whoever serves me must follow me, he says. I am the way and the truth and the life, he says. The question for us is whether we have the courage to follow where that way leads us. 
in South Africa, with the help of Archbishop Tutu and others, they were able to step out in courage and find a path toward healing. To let the old covenant die and to find new life in a new way of being. A life that made uh, for black and white South Africans together. Their journey is far from over. But I still wonder if it isn't a testimony to the truth of Jesus' words. An invitation to us to take a similar leap of faith if we truly wish to see the end of racism. Maybe, just maybe, Jesus is right. If we let go of our lives for the good of all, maybe we will end up finding new life that is eternal. Dear people of God, we stand in the shadow of the prophets crying out for justice and peace. God calls us to be people of reconciliation, serving a world in need. Courageous women and men have taken the risk of standing up and speaking out for the least and the lowest. This work involves risking ourselves for the sake of God's love, moving beyond ourselves in order to seek and serve Christ and one another. We are called to work for the Ministry of Social Justice and Reconciliation. And so I ask you, people of God, will you persevere in prayer and fellowship? If so, respond, I will with God's help. Will you proclaim the good news of reconciliation in both word and deed? I will with God's help. 
will you strive to see Christ in all persons, both with whom you agree and disagree? I will, with God's help. Will you seek to mend what is broken by human sin and greed? I will, with God's help. Will you work toward dismantling the sin of abuse of power? I will, with God's help. In the name of Christ and this church, I commission you to stand up, to speak out, to live into the reign of Christ our Savior. Amen. Relying on the promise of God, we pray boldly for the church, the world, and all those in need. Your presence fills the earth. You call us to pay attention to all your creation. From the tiniest grains of wheat to the mighty thunder, grant us weather that prepares the soil for seeds. Protect us from violent storms, flooding, and wildfires. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You promise to write your law on our hearts. Guide all the citizens of the world as we labor to build communities that reflect your justice and peace. Bless us with the creativity we need to work for the welfare of all. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. You sustain us with your bountiful spirit. Restore the joy of all who need your presence. Be with the lonely. Be with those who are ill in body or mind, and with those who are dying, and with those who grieve. Be with those we name now, silently or loud. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Jesus calls us to follow him in life and in death. Empower this congregation in discipleship. Equip children and teachers in Sunday school and confirmation. Give all of us your truth. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We praise you for those who have given us words to worship you. Bring us with them into life everlasting. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of holy ground, move us to lament and repent. Open our hearts, bodies, minds, and souls to the cries of your people. Transform us by your presence. Drive us into action for the dismantling of racism in relationships, communities, and societies. Bless us with the companions who support us, challenge us, and helping us keep being going. We pray for the elimination of racial discrimination. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We entrust ourselves and all our prayers to you, O faithful God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hi, everyone. I would like to share with you some ways that our members have been generous during this past 12 months of financial upheaval caused by COVID-19. Some members of the congregation have been able to continue making gifts beyond their regular offering to Agnes Day. Some have donated monthly to reduce the principal on our mortgage. This is a great help to our financial situation. ELCA World Hunger, Fish, and Backpacks for Kids also receive monthly donations from many people. During our Building a Culture of Generosity campaign, I learned, and I quote, living generously rejects the presumption that there won't be enough, so I have to hold tight to what I have. I think this explains why some in our congregation decided they don't need to hold on tight to their stimulus checks. One person used their first stimulus check as a challenge gift for returning intent cards during our stewardship campaign. One couple divided their stimulus money between FISH, the Agnes Day Community Assistance Fund, and the General Fund. Another couple plans to donate their current stimulus money to help with homelessness and hunger. Being generous is not all about giving lots of money. Mark 12, 41 to 44 speaks of this. As Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small coins. 
Truly I tell you, he said, this poor widow has put in more money than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she out of her poverty put in all she had to live on. Here we learn that you don't need to give a great amount to be generous. The little that the widow was able to give was worth more to God than all the wealth he had given. I think we can also infer from this story that even small gifts can become important. A good example of this would be our fortress of toilet paper that was donated to fish. When you look at one person's donation, it does not seem like very much. But when they are all added together, it becomes a great gift. One of our members kept buying toilet paper every time he went to Costco in December. His wife finally told him that they had enough toilet paper and wanted to know why he kept buying more. His answer was, if there is another toilet paper shortage, I'm going to make sure that Agnes Day will have enough to give to fish in January. I don't have time today to pay tribute to all of the ways that our members have been generous. I want to say thank you to all who have donated time, food, clothing, other items, and money to Agnes Day and its ministries. Let us prepare our hearts and our homes to receive the Lord's Supper. Blessed are you, O God of the journey. Your mercy is everlasting and your faithfulness endures from age to age. You set your bow in the clouds as a sign to Noah, and gave Avram and Sarai new names to seal your covenant. In the wilderness, you blessed Israel with your law, an everlasting testament to your love for them. Through grumbling and rebellion, through wilderness and exile, you remained with your people, faithful when we were faithless, until the time when you sent your son to establish a new covenant, which could not be broken, to write your law upon our hearts. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Whenever we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. You are with us still, faithful God. Send your Holy Spirit and strengthen us for our journey with this bread and cup, a foretaste of the feast which is to come, when all the world will be fed at your table of justice and mercy. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit. Join our prayers with Noah, with Abraham and Sarah, with Moses and Joshua, with the prophets and the martyrs of every age, who have looked with the eyes of faith to see your promised deliverance, which you have made tangible in your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him, all honor and glory is yours, O divine beloved, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. If you are not receiving the meal this morning, and receive this blessing. May you forever follow Jesus from death into new life. Amen. If you are receiving the meal this morning, hear these words of promise. This is the body of Christ given for you.
This is the blood of Christ shed for you. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in life that is eternal. Amen. Let us pray. God of steadfast love, at this table you gather your people into one body for the sake of the world. Send us in the power of your spirit that our lives bear witness to the love that has made us new in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Before we conclude, I'd like to share a few announcements. First of all, I mentioned last week that we are do providing an option for drive through communion in the church parking lot on Easter afternoon. We will still celebrate Holy Communion as a part of the digital service that morning, but those who wish and who feel comfortable uh, will be able to come by the church parking lot and receive the sacrament in your car. We'll begin at 1 p.m. and go for at least an hour. Um, we will need to know how many to expect, and so we'll ask folks who are coming to let us know by Wednesday of Holy Week. If we have a lot of interest, we will extend that time window to make sure that we have time for everyone who wants to, to come uh, share that meal. You can uh, find more details in upcoming emails and, in our, and on our website. I'm also really excited to announce uh, that on you stay, we'll be having a seminary student working with us this year. Heidi Gerling is a distance learning student at Pacific Lutheran Theological Seminary in California who lives uh, here in Gig Harbor. She's a member of Peninsula Lutheran. As part of her seminary program, she'll be working with our congregation to learn more about pastoral ministry. You'll occasionally see her leading worship or helping plan programs or attending council or committee meetings, maybe even preaching a few times um, throughout the year. This came about kind of quickly. Um, I was recently contacted by the seminary who said they had a student in the area who needed to find a congregational placement. It's preferred that students don't actually um, do this with their home congregation uh, because we, they wanna, want them to receive a breadth of experience. Um, so it's, uh, I was really happy to help out knowing that this congregation has so much to offer in the way of experience and warmth. She's not joining our staff. She's only gonna be here for a year. She's only gonna be helping out for a few hours each week. Uh, the main goal of this program is for her to gain some experience, to kind of try a little bit of everything. Um, so I'm really delighted that we have this opportunity as a congregation to help contribute to the raising up of new leaders for the church. And I'm glad that she has the opportunity to get to know you all. That is uh, really a blessing. So Heidi will officially begin working with us next week. So you might see her participating in worship occasionally after that. Uh, we will officially install her soon after Easter, once we get um, uh, all of these holidays, once these are all behind us, then we will be able to focus on that some more. So if you'd like to send a message of welcome to Heidi, uh, please feel free to send a card or an email to the church office and we'll make sure that she gets that. Once again, I'd like to thank you for being a part of this worship service today. If you found today's service meaningful, please be sure to like this video and subscribe to our channel. You can gather right here with Anya's Day for worship every Sunday at 9.45 a.m. 
Also, uh, don't forget, you are invited to join uh, the Wednesday um, Lenten practice, the Saints, uh, Saints for Today. That happens via Zoom every Wednesday at 11 a.m. and again at 7 p.m. The link to that can be found on our website uh, and the phone number if you'd like to dial in. Um, on you stay Lutheran.org, go under events and you can find the link there. Uh, that I invite you to go in peace. Christ is with you. Amen. Thanks be to God. I invite you to share the peace of Christ with someone you know uh, with a phone call or an email or a text message or by sharing the link to this video on your social media page or sending it to somebody you care about so that you can worship together. God bless you in your week.